welcome everybody to the first uh, uh, session of uh, this conference. As uh, Monica already told, I'm uh, Francesca Brunetti. I'm just going to put the ball for the match because I'm very bad in volleyball. So who wants to join afterwards, please? <laughs> <laughs> Just let me move. Anyway, uh, I'll start the morning session. Uh, it's uh, our uh, great pleasure to, uh, to have here uh, Professor uh, um, Kafafi. Uh, so uh, she uh, actually, uh, I was <laughs> preparing uh, a little uh, biography. So she's an adjunct professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in Leith University in Bethlehem, USA. So she was uh, uh, working in many, many uh, different uh, uh, countries and uh, institutes. Uh, and uh, she was at uh, NSF for many years. And she was the director uh, of uh, uh, the um, activity uh, on organic and optoelectronic session. She, has having, she was having many, many prizes and uh, a lot of work done in the field of organic uh, and uh, now are also perovskite solar cell. So what she's going to do today, she's going to talk about the recent process on organic and hybrid organic, inorganic yeah, yeah. and perovskite solar based solar cell in the USA. So she's, uh, uh, she's going to present the activity uh, in uh, the United States related to organic and perovskite solar cell. So let's welcome uh, Professor Kafafi for her presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I'm so happy here to be in Barcelona, one of uh, my favorite uh, cities in, in Europe. Uh, so I would like to start by thanking all the organizers of this wonderful conference, and particularly to Monica for her kind invitation for me to join you all here in celebrating your accomplishments and uh, in the wrap up session here. And, uh, and I chose to uh, share with you, uh, you know, uh, some recent highlights and progress uh, made in organic photovoltaics and hybrid organic, uh, inorganic organic photovoltaics in the US because I noticed most of the speakers, if not all, except for one, are from Europe. So I thought it might be worthwhile to just you know, touch base and see what's going on in the US and only very recent work. What happened? Technology never fails to <laughs> surprise us. <laughs> it was working, I just tested. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, I would like to start by uh, giving a talk from a colleague of mine when I was at Rice University, uh, the late professor uh, Richard Smalley, who won the Nobel Prize uh, many years ago, in uh, almost what, 22 years ago for discovering buckyballs. And Rick said, to give all people on Earth the level of energy prosperity we in the developed world are used to, we would need to generate 60 terawatts of energy per day, which is the equivalent of burning 900 million barrels of oil per day. The challenge is then, and that's the challenge, sorry, That's the challenge for all of us, is to develop energy sources that provide energy affordability and reliability without negative impacts on the environment at the terawatt scale. 
Also, Rick pointed out the top 10 problems for the next five years, and the top one was energy. He estimated, um, he, uh, when he gave his, uh, this quote, the world population was 6.3 billion uh, people. He, estimate, he estimated that by 2015, we'll have between 8 to 10 billion people. And that was smart. He gave a very big range here. Well, today's world population is, has est was estimated to have reached 7.6 billion as of last uh, December. And the United Nations estimate it will further increase to 11.8 billion by the year 2100. So Rick was not, not that far off, you know, in his wide range of estimate of the uh, number of people that will be occupying our Earth. The International Agency, uh, Energy Agency Technology Roadmap estimated that 32 years from now, photovoltaics will provide about 11% of all global electricity production. So for this, we need more efficient panel because that would mean fewer uh, panels will be uh, needed to produce the same amount of energy. So that's one of our challenge. And uh, this is a project that was developed uh, by DOE. It's called Sunshot. And uh, the amount of power that is produced by a photovoltaic system depends upon the solar resource availability. This is in addition to other uh, factors like temperatures, snowfalls, and so forth. So the median that uh, Sunshot used for that is Kansas City, uh, Missouri. You know, so this is the median. Uh, if we go to sunny California, we can lower the price, the cost, because we can get more solar power. But if you go to cloudy Seattle, you know, it will cost more. So it's, uh, so uh, we have to keep that into consideration, especially in Europe. You know, I mean, southern Europe, you know, Mediterranean countries versus northern Europe is very different. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the progress that was made in the Sunshot program. Uh, there is one that's just finished, and uh, they have done quite a bit of uh, progress. But since the Solar Energy Office launched this program initiative like seven years ago, Solar power in the U.S. was really slim. It was less than 0.1% of the U.S. electricity supply. And the installed capacity was about 3 gigawatt. Uh, as of this uh, past year, solar supply is more now than 1% of U.S. electricity demand within installed capacity more than 47 gig gigawatt. This is still very, very little. In uh, 2017, the, the solar industry uh, achieved Sunshot's original 2020 cost target, which was six cents per kilowatt hour. F this is for the utility scale PV solar power. So they were three years ahead of schedule, uh, dropping from 28 to 60 cent six cents per kilowatt. The cost targets for residential and commercial are slightly different, so the scale have dropped for uh, residential from 52 to 16 cents per kilowatt and for commercial from 40 to 11 cents per kilowatt. Now there is a second uh, project that uh, called Sunshot 2030 Waterfalls. And, and if you look at, and if we look at the progress or the goals for the residential, we started in 2010, 52 cents per kilowatt. And the goal now is an order of magnitude smaller, five cents per kilowatt for commercial is uh, it was 40 cents and the goal again is an order of magnitude smaller. For utility, it was 28 cents and uh, the goal is a little bit less than an order of magnitude smaller, about three cents. So there are many uh, pathways uh, for achieving uh, this uh, three cents per kilowatt for uh, utility, uh, kilowatt hour for utility. And these are very aggressive uh, and ambitious pathways, but there are many, more than one uh, route to achieve that. 
So for improve, you can. So one of the goal is to improve the efficiency uh, while decreasing the cost. And uh, there are many ways of doing it. Uh, examples like re reduction of impurities and defects in the multi crystal materials, and uh, improving screen print, metal paste, and so forth. Uh, so uh, this is uh, to lower the price while. Uh, 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 lower the price while increasing the, the, the efficiency essentially. And then uh, we have to, uh, we'll have to have a, a, a lower balance uh, of system hardware component costs also that can be reduced. So uh, one example is to identify materials that can withstand higher system voltage. Another is high frequency inverters. I'm going to go fast on this and then improving upon, uh, so going to even, you know, cutting down more on price, we can improve upon today's best in class reliability in low cost module. For example, the glass polymer module can transition to more durable glass, glass module construction, or we can accelerate testing method to provide rapid feedback to guide improvement in a module durability. And the operation and maintenance costs can be reduced by automation. Example, automated field inspection by thermal and uh, electroluminescence imaging, automated panel cleanings, and so on. So this is, uh, this is kind of uh, one of the pathways to achieve uh, three cents per kilowatt uh, hours. There is also an alternative, pa another pathway to, uh, to achieve five cents per kilowatt hours for residential PV. And I'm not going to go over that, but anyway, uh, there have been many, uh, uh, you know, strategies for that. Uh, and this is just giving you the example of the distribution of the cost between profit, customer acquisition, labor, supply chain, and so on. So photovoltaics, the field of photovoltaics has been around with us, with us for over 60 years now with the development of uh, the silicon cell uh, in the Bell Labs in the early 50s. So the evolution of photovoltaic is very interesting because if you look at all the development and the different generation of photovoltaics, you will see that uh, it initially it was based on inorganic materials. And uh, photo, photovoltaics uh, progress has been really materials dependent. So as I say, we started with silicon photovoltaics. It was pure inorganic. And then more uh, recently, it wasn't until 1986, when, when Xing Wang Tang in uh, Kodak uh, uh, developed the first efficient purely organic photovoltaic cell that was used on that was based on uh, small molecules. Then a few years later, Alan Heger and Sirdar Sarisifchi uh, showed that you can get a very efficient charge transfer from a polymer that acts as a whole donor or a whole transporter to a buckyball C60 that was discovered by Smalley as an electron acceptor. So they developed a polymer-based uh, solar cell and then people realize that they can take advantages of both the properties of organic and inorganic by combining them in a hybrid type of cell. And one of the cells that was developed later on was the Gretzel cell, which is the photoelectrochemical cell. And now we are uh, with the organic inorganic perovskite based cell. So this is kind of the development of the different materials used for organic solar cells and where we are at this moment. Uh, here I just show you the uh, part of the NRL uh, uh, figure here which shows the, the power conversion efficiency in uh, the progress in uh, the power conversion efficiency for different types of cell over the last decade. And what's impressive that we have reached very high efficiencies, but in my opinion, what was most impressive is the rate of progress that our community has achieved as far as efficiencies. And it's possible, but you know, it's a little bit general here, to group the progress made for different types of cells by countries, Germany, Japan, the US, 
And uh, South Korea, this is not totally accurate, but I thought it'd be fun to look at it this way, since I'm going to only focus now on the progress made in the US. So, and I'm not going to talk too much about inorganic because this is, uh, uh, even though they are, they have achieved the highest efficiencies, they are quite expensive and not practical for many applications, but it was wor it's worthwhile mentioning the work of the group of Zach Holman at uh, Arizona State University where he did, uh, he made some uh, progress for the silicon heterojunction solar cell, you know, uh, you know developing uh, new contact materials uh, uh, that have uh, low resistivity and was able to passive them so he was able to reach fairly local <coughs> contact resistivities. He also was able to tune the cell performance for the IR spectrum for in, in the tandem structures and he achieved the highest IR uh, external quantum effort, uh, efficiency reported for a silicon uh, cell. Um, um, in collaboration with another group at Arizona State University, Zhang's groups, you know, uh, they have, uh, they got in a very efficient uh, cat tail uh, cell with very high uh, open circuit voltage. They also demonstrated that amorphous silicon hole contact has, it can extract full internal uh, voltage. Developed um, another type of cell which is a cat magnesium telluride uh, with a band gap of 1.7 EV and also another absorber, polycrystal absorber, where he replaced the magnesium with the zinc, uh, achieving 10% power, uh, record, uh, power conversion efficiency. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, here uh, also he has done a fairly efficient module based on gallium arsenide uh, silicon and uh, measure their efficiencies outdoor. And, and I'm not gonna go over that, but what I was, going to end up by showing for, for this inorganic cell, you know, they went from uh, one junction, double junction, three, three junction, five junction, and the predicting how far the efficiency can go. So, I mean, it can go very, very high, but with a big, big price to make. So that's why we, this is not where our community is. Our community wants to have practical solar cell they can have many wide uh, applications. Some of these cells are good for you know, space, uh, uh, space applications. We would like to do application on Earth. So here are uh, some of the uh, progress th that has been made on, on organic uh, solar cells. This is uh, the group of Yang Yang at uh, UCLA, where he has shown that, you know, just by controlling uh, the structure for, for a, turn, a ternary blend uh, from, you know, uh, uh, having a, like a very ordered structure, you can get a gain of about 14 to 21% in power conversion efficiency. <laughs> so, you know, going from a binary system to uh, 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 a ternary system to a control, with a control structure, you can get, achieve 11%. You can also tune uh, the, uh, and engineer the interfaces, and you can use non-fullerene acceptor for this. And uh, this is, uh, he, uh, he, you know, uh, he showed that we can achieve about 11.6% power conversion efficiency for these uh, uh, type of organic cells, which are still good because they, they, they are quite stable, you know. So we, we're still, the, the, the pure organic photovoltaic, some of them, not all of them, there's, the, their stabilities are a little bit more superior than, than you know, the uh, ferroviskites. And this is one, obviously, of the goals as to how we can achieve this a similar or better stability for the ferroviskites. But he was able to do that, uh, to over, have maximum overlap of the active layer with the solar spectrum with no charge recombination trap and no distribution, uh, no disruption of the optimized morphology of the active layer. Uh, then he realized, so realized, like most of us, that perovskites now is the way to go. So he tried to uh, uh, modify uh, the halide perovskite film with polymer, and, and he was able to obtain efficient and stable planar heterojunction solar cell uh, using this approach. Uh, so so um, he showed that a key parameter in the passivation uh, using functionalized polymer uh, so this will ha provide a good binding interaction between the peroxide and the polymer film. Where it was a key parameter in the passivation of the peroxide layer. And uh, 
he was able to increase the power conversion efficiency, for instance, with one of the polymer, the PVP, f from 17.5% to 19%. This is, uh, he succeeded in doing that while 85% of the initial power conversion efficiency was retained for up to 90 days. So that's what, what he tested. Uh, he also uh, showed another, published another uh, study where he was able to uh, achieve efficient perovskite solar cell uh, via self-assembled uh, monolayers and again controlling uh, the interfacial chemical interaction in this case. Uh, then uh, the group of uh, XY Zoo at Columbia uh, show, uh, uh, demonstrated um, the crystal liquid duality uh, of uh, the lead halide uh, porous perovskite. So he gave us a united view of the optoelectronic properties of these type of cells. So these cell, uh, these mat uh, these uh, uh, materials belong to uh, phonon glass electron crystals, and uh, so the binary structure consists of a large like a lead halide and a more weakly bound uh, cation uh, sublattices. So, uh, so this, this results in a coherent band transport, which is expected for crystal semiconductors, but dielectric responses and phonon dynamics typicals of liquids. Uh, and these materials are prom show promise for to be efficient thermoelectrics. Uh, the group of Jin Sang Huang, who moved uh, recently from Nebraska to University of North Carolina, uh, demonstrated a record power conversion efficiency that he achieved for single crystal solar cell using below gap, uh, band gap uh, absorption of the perovskite. Uh, so if you look here at the absorption of the polyclistron uh, perovskite film versus a single crystal, you see that it has a uh, much broader uh, spectral response than uh, the polycrystal material. And <laughs> while the open uh, voltage, uh, circuit voltage and field factor were not uh, sacrificed. Uh, uh, Jin Song Wang and his group also did some interesting studies, uh, a more in-depth kind of understanding of things. So he, he showed that uh, the, what am I doing here? I'm trying to point out, <laughs> sorry. So he showed that uh, perovskite films fabricated by existing method, are he showed that they were strained. And this strain was induced by mismatch in thermal expansion of the perovskite films and substrate during uh, the annealing process. So they have a, a compressive strain in the out-of-plane direction and in-plane tensile strain. This is due to, in, uh, uh, this lead to increase in ion migration, which was observed in this strain film. And this latter strain accelerated degradation of the perovoxides under illumination. So very insightful studies in this regard. Um, uh, he also demonstrates something very interesting and if possible, it will open a new avenue for the formation of large and continuously open circle voltage without being limited by the material's band gap. He shows an, that an anomalous fault photovoltaic effect in lateral device structure leading to open circuit voltages that are larger than the band gap. And uh, he attributed this effect to the formation of tunneling junction randomly dispersed in polycrystalline film. So the uh, formation of these tunneling junction as a result of ion migration, uh, he was able to visualize that using the technique of Calvin probe force microscopy scanning. Um, another interesting uh, type of materials that was uh, developed and studied uh, by the group of Michael Wazulowski and Mercury Kanatsis at Northwestern, uh, it's a new type of lead-free tin-based perovoxide absorbers that contain both ethylene, a diammonium, and formamidinium. So the cation increases the air stability and photoelectric property. And the 3D structure, this is 3D structure, is, uh, was, was shown to be stable with uh, methyl ammonium, uh, the formamidinium, and cesium cations. They 
easily, uh, they, these are easily tunable gaps with solid solution, and they demonstrated fairly high efficiency for this lead-free type of PVK cell. While 96% of the initial efficiency was retained for obviously the encapsulated cell after more than a thousand hours um, aging process. So, and uh, another interesting phenomena was observed by the group of uh, uh, DT Mohinti and Los Alamos in collaboration with actually subgroups from Northwestern as well and Rice University. Um, uh, as, we, uh, as we know, the two-dimensional Ruddlesden popper peroxide are solution-processed quantum wells. Their band gaps can be tuned via control of the film's thickness, which, which depends on this N here, the value of N. And he, they showed that the photophysics is dominated by lower energy states associated with the local intrinsic electronic structure of the edge of the peroxide films. So for uh, quantum wells uh, films that has a thickness twice the peroxide crystal uh, units, which is about 1.3 nanometer, uh, uh, you, you have a photophysics where the states, the, where the, the states provide a, a direct pathway for dissociation of exciton into long-lived carrier that substantially improve the performance of the solar cell. So, uh, so you get this long-lived photocarrier that can go to electron, and this way you can higher, get higher efficiency. Uh, and they were doing, you, they were, uh, you know, so they were, you know, you're looking at uh, these uh, films and then uh, cleaving them, cleaning them, and showing, you know, the imperfection in some areas. As they're probing this with this technique. So uh, long-range hot carrier transport was also uh, measured uh, in hybrid peroxide using ultra-fast microscopy. This is a group of Huang at Purdue University. Uh, so the, 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 the point here is that the chocolate quasar limit for solar cell can be overcome if hot carriers can be harvested before they are thermalized. So uh, in this uh, particular uh, materials, they observed uh, the quasi-ballistic transport. And this non non the non-equilibrium transport uh, persisted more than tens of picoseconds and 600 nanometer, which is a long way before reaching the diffusive <laughs> transport limit. So this opened the doors for application for hot carrier devices based on perovskites. Uh, some people also have studied uh, quantum dots uh, uh, based on perovskites, and they showed, um, this is the group of Luther at uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, where they showed enhanced mobility for these quantum dot arrays uh, uh, <coughs> with high voltage. So these are lead halide quantum dot films with tuned surface chemistry. Uh, based on the uh, side cation salt treatment. They did some treatment. They were able to synthesize them using friendly solvent, um, uh, friendly solvents, and able to decouple the grain growth from fill deposition, which led to higher open circuit voltage and double film mobility. So this, uh, for instance, the cesium lead iodide quantum dot, uh, had a, a tunable band gap between 1.75 to 2.3, where you know, are ideal for kind of all PVK junction solar cell, and they were able to get fairly high quantum uh, uh, power conversion efficiency for these uh, 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 quantum dot uh, solar cells. Uh, then Zach uh, 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 Holman's group provided a very efficient uh, silicon cell to Mike Magihi, and together they form a very uh, good uh, you know, a pair of sky silicon tandem solar cell that published their work last year in Nature with a record efficiency of 23.6%. Uh, and uh, they showed that to replace the methyl ammonium with a mixture of cesium and formadinium, and, and then have also a mixture of brom brom bromide and iodide, it improved the thermal stability of the cell. They use different materials for the whole uh, transport, uh, like nickel oxide, and for electron transport, like C60, uh, in place of titanium oxide, which is undergo, uh, known to undergo photo degradation. 
and uh, they were able to uh, fairly recently achieve 24.5 percent uh, uh, record efficiency for this tandem solar cell using a uh, silicon cell with a power conversion of 21 percent and peroxide cell with a 15 percent quantum efficiency. Uh, so uh, uh, surface passivation uh, was demonstrated to suppress uh, the, uh, the, the, the problem that sometimes is observed in this high band gap, uh, per, uh, I mean, for, for these tandem cells, because they undergo phase separation into iodine and bromine rich uh, regions. So high band gap peroxide are needed for, for in order to uh, suppress this effect. And, uh, and anyway, uh, this is what they demonstrated and achieved their record efficiency. So in closing, I would like uh, to uh, uh, remind some of you, because some, a lot of you know about that, uh, we're going to hold the next organic hybrid and uh, peroxide photovoltaic uh, uh, conference in beautiful and sunny San Diego. This year is going to be between the week of the 19th to the 23rd of August. And uh, I have extended uh, the abstract submission was February 6th, but I expanded by a month. So you are all welcome uh, to join us in uh, beautiful San Diego and learning about the latest and greatest in the field of organic hybrid and pyroxide photovoltaics. And again, I would like to say thank Monica and the organizer for including me uh, in uh, this wonderful conference. So now the session is open for question. Question? First of all, thank you very much for a very interesting review. I have a linguistic question. You put perovskite solar cells in a group of first generated photovoltaics. In your view, what is the border between the third generation? Oh, this is totally uh, arbitrary, in my opinion, to be honest. I mean, thank you for pointing that out. You know, it, it just, people like to group, you know, the evolution and development of solar cells by uh, materials and so forth, but uh, it's arbitrary. <laughs> Other questions? So maybe I have one. Sure. So uh, you uh, were showing a very nice overview of what is has been done uh, in the uh, USA related to OPV and uh, Periscite. So uh, what do you think is uh, the direction, uh, let's say? So if you can uh, give a comment uh, on the uh, more general view on how to use the t these technologies and uh, which is also the time scale uh, in which uh, this technology can... Well, enter I mean, uh, the, uh, story. The, the field of periscites really has uh, exploded <laughs> in the last, uh, I would say, few years, and people now are not looking as, uh, as uh, for periscites as materials just for solar cells, but are they are doing looking at them for laser materials. They are looking at them for uh, ferro you know, uh, you know, electric materials, other application that have started to surface, and I just heard from Mo Monica yesterday that doing transistors using perovskites as well. So I think, I think uh, this is a very old, old materials that uh, finding new applications, you know, people discovering new applications uh, for it. So I think, I think uh, we're going to see in the next uh, decade or so, we're going to see a lot of applications, a lot of progress made in that. And, they, and, and in my opinion, the U.S. is, is lagging behind Europe and, and Korea, South Korea especially, in this field. Uh, uh, you know, uh, ironically, two big areas were discovered uh, by uh, Ching Wang Tang in Kodak. Organic light emitting diode in 1987 and organic photovoltaic a year before you know, in 1986. But really, uh, unfortunately, uh, the... US, U.S. industry was not, um, did not have the vision to continue in that research and, and, and lead the world rather than 
follow the world, and that's what's happening. So, are there other questions? So, yes? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, no, no, it covers all materials, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, other question? If not, then thank again, uh, Professor. Thank you.